Nos metemos en esta segunda parte, en estos documentales que compartimos en nuestro Cartago a través de las licencias del Creative Commons, ¿eh? que es compartir, que se distribuya la fuente de información. Hoy con un tema trascendental para entender el siglo XXI, para entender lo que pasó y preguntarnos hacia dónde puede desembocar las políticas en Oriente Medio. Estamos hablando de El Hijo del General, el testimonio del escritor Mico Peled. Now here's something of immense proportion that takes place and take into account that this is over four decades ago. And again I quote, At the first weekly meeting of the general staff after the Six-Day War, Chief of Staff Itzhak Rabin was beaming with the glory of victory. But when the meeting was nearing its end, my father raised his hand. When he was called on, he spoke of the unique chance the victory offered to solve the Palestinian problem once and for all. For the first time, he said, in Israel's history, we were face to face with the Palestinians without any other Arab countries between us. Now we had a chance to offer them a state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. He claimed with certainty that holding on to the West Bank and people who lived in it was contrary to Israel's long-term strategy. Popular resistance to the occupation was sure to rise And Israel, Israel's army would be used to quell that resistance with disastrous and demoralizing results. It would turn the Jewish state into an increasingly brutal occupying power and eventually into a binational state. And this is precisely the reality in which we live today, nearly four and a half decades after that. So does anyone seriously, can, can we really expect that five million Palestinians will keep living under a regime that is democratic to Jews, but is brutally oppressive towards Palestinians, with about six million Jews and about five or five and a half million Palestinians living in, under the same rule, under the same government, but with different laws. My father, who was a military expert, had spent the remainder of his life after he retired from the military fighting for justice for the Palestinian cause. And being a former military man, he was often asked about Palestinian terrorism. Um, on one such occasion, when he was being interviewed by the Israeli television, he said this about terrorism. He said, terrorism is a terrible thing, but the fact remains that when a small nation is governed by a larger power, terrorism is the only means at their disposal. My father's predictions have all come true. Now, the work of the Israeli lobby in the United States notwithstanding, more and more people around the world are beginning to realize that there are in fact two nations who live between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean and that the conditions under which Palestinians live are completely unacceptable. Uh, recently we had an event here in San Diego which was a vigil to, to, remember the, to remember those who were killed in Gaza by the Israeli army. And as this vigil was taking place There was a large contingent of Israeli supporters. We were separated from them by a line of police and what I think is a sense of morality. And they were dancing and singing as those of us that were at the vigil commemorated tried to, or tried to recall the names of 1,400 people that were killed. These were three weeks of such death and destruction that one can hardly comprehend. Now I remember the stories of the Israeli Air, Air Force pilots who flew sortie after sortie, dumping hundreds of tons of bombs on a civilian population in Gaza, and would then return home to celebrate the festival of Hanukkah. See, because the attacks in Gaza at the end of 2007 took place during the Jewish festival of Hanukkah. Then, these same pilots, having celebrated with their families, slept in the comfort of their beds, got up the next day, and did it again and again and again. I recall that while we were at the vigil, these the supporters of Israel held signs that said, but the Israeli army had warned them. The Israeli army had dropped thousands of leaflets warning the Palestinians that this horror was about to, to begin. And I can only imagine the mother seeing these warnings knowing that this horror was impending, but also knowing that there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. There's nowhere to save her children 
from the bombs and from the fire, from the smoke and from the chemicals, and from the phosphorus that consumes the flesh and won't be extinguished. Because Gaza is locked down. Gaza is under siege, a siege that was imposed by Israel on the people of Gaza. So for these young Israeli pilots, these young men who most Israelis and, and Israeli supporters around the world consider their finest, this was really nothing but shooting fish in a barrel as they began their merciless onslaught at exactly 11.25 in the morning on December the 27th, 2008. And that date, December 27, 2008, will forever be etched in our memories as the darkest and most shameful day in the long history of the Jewish people. As Israel began a shameful and merciless attack on the people of Gaza. The attacks began at 11.25 in the morning, the precise time that the children of Gaza are on the streets. Between 11 and 11.30, Children of Gaza are either on the way to school or on the way home from school, as that is the time that the two shifts of the school day change. Now, the, the, the Israeli supporters who come to the vigils, who always maintain that they support Israeli brutality, their claim is that Israel had the right to defend itself, but Israel's actions were, were justified because Israel was defending itself against the onslaught of rockets that were being shot into Israel by Hamas militants out of Gaza. Thousands and thousands of rockets that were designed to harm Israeli citizens. Now I know a thing or two about these rockets. I recall sitting on a Saturday afternoon with my family and my children in a kibbutz not far from Gaza. And at one point we heard those rockets flying overhead and we heard the sirens and the, the warning signs. And we all had to run into the protective rooms that were built for that. And it was frightening. Only last December, I visited the kibbutz again, and a Qassam rocket fell by the kindergarten on the kibbutz while the children were present and were outside. There was shattered glass everywhere. Children were hurt. They were bleeding. Some of the children had to be hospitalized. Some of the children were in shock. It was horrible. I went and I walked and I saw the hole in the ground created by the rocket, the size of a large soccer ball. And then I remembered what a crater that is, that is created by a one-ton bomb looks like. It's the size of a city block. Children aren't scratched, and they're not in shock as a result of that. They're decimated. They are burnt. They choke, under the, they choke from the fumes, and they are buried in the rubble. Now, multiply that by 100, and then again, and then again. And remember, or keep in mind, that Gaza is one of the most, highly, most densely populated areas in the world. Yet, Israeli supporters will justify this. Many Jewish people will recall the story in the book of Genesis, chapter 18, where God decides to destroy the city of Sodom because they were sinners. And the, patriarch Abra the patriarch Abraham, the shared patriarch of Jews and Arabs, chastises God and says to him, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Perhaps there be 50 righteous in the city. You see, Abraham is chastising God. And God promises that if he finds 50 righteous people, he will spare the city. Well, in Israel, there is no Abraham today. And no Palestinians are righteous in the eyes of the Israelis. And as we know, the 800,000 children of Gaza were not spared this horror. You know, I'm often accused of being one-sided and of not mentioning Palestinian terrorism and the suffering that Israelis have to go through. So I'm going to touch on that right now.